God and all the time, God is good. Amen. We're so glad to have you join us here at Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church here on our Wednesday night Bible study, a place we come time and time again to study and open up the Word of God. And we say grace and peace to all of you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, to all of our members that are watching and listening, and to all of our Facebook covenant partners. We thank you for joining us. As, as they used to say in the old church, so glad to be in the number one more time. One more time. So we thank the ones that are here uh, tonight. They sacrifice their about an hour every Wednesday night at 6 30 to come out and join us. And if you want to come and join us, uh, we do our temperature check. We have separation here. We're not uh, together, but we're sitting at social distance. And we do your temperature check. Please come and join us. Uh, you can sit live with us and enjoy uh, our teaching on Wednesday nights. Uh, we're praying for all of you, all of our, our members that stand in the need of prayer. I had a chance to talk to a couple of our members today and visit a few of them today. They seem to be doing well. Uh, to all of you that stand in the need of prayer, we are praying for you. This lesson series that I've been dealing with in the last couple of weeks uh, was given to me uh, by one of our Facebook and our email partners, uh, the book of 2 Thessalonians. And it is a wonderful and awesome book because it has its relevance in our today. And when you read it historically, and most of you know it as a teacher, uh, you cannot make relevance for today unless you know the history of yesterday. And so I've always, I was always taught in seminary, we have to have critical, historical uh, understanding to see uh, why it was written, uh, to who it was written to, in order to, for us to interpret it correctly. So this has been my charge, my challenge, these last couple of weeks to do that. And I hope you are willing to share and open up your sharing with others who want to hear from the Word of God as it relates to this wonderful book of 2 Thessalonians. Uh, so let's prepare our hearts and minds and hopefully you have uh, your writing utensils, your, your notepads. Uh, as I always say, maybe some of you write on your iPads or type it in to your laptops. But please take good notes. And if you want my outline, uh, if you just put in your email address, type it in, uh, I can send you the outline for the series. Tonight is week number three, where we're dealing with 2 Thessalonians. And uh, just to recap from last week, last week we talked about how this letter was formed. And when you begin to read uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it is a greeting from the author. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 is a greeting from Paul. And I said last week, anytime you do a greeting in antiquity or in uh, ancient history, there are three things you look for in a greeting. Paul, first of all, he gave an announcement of the sender. The sender was Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They were the senders. And then you have to give an announcement of who is receiving that letter. And we found out that the church of Thessalonica, the Christians, were receiving the letter. And then after we find out who the senders were, who it was sent to, then there is the greeting. Okay? And so... Paul says in this greeting, or the author says in this greeting, in essence, grace and peace come from God our Father alone. So in other words, he starts off with God is our Father. He connects God to someone we know about, a Father. And he says God is our Father, and he greets them with grace and peace. And there's a reason, brothers and sisters, that he starts off with grace and peace only because there were some things that were going on in this particular time of the church. There were some things going along in, 
in uh, the church of Thessalonica uh, that Paul wanted to make sure they knew who the agent of their salvation was. And the agent, here it is again, was, was God. Not only is he God, listen closely, but he's, he's the Father. Amen. You say amen to that. Because not only is he God, creator of both heaven and earth, and that he is, but he's also a personal God. Amen. amen. And who could be more personal than a father? Amen. <laughs> amen. So Paul says he's, he is the agent. Not only is he God the Father, but God the Father is someone special to all of us. Thessalonica, that God the Father, brothers and sisters, is the agent of our salvation. Amen. In other words, the agent of our really is. Amen. So when you greet people, you tell people about God, you can't leave out Jesus. You don't just pray and say in the name of God, you say in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but came in the likeness of humanity. Right? And he lived among us, and he was obedient even to the death of the cross. And God highly exalted his name. He was given a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every tongue should confess. Amen? Amen. There it is. God the Father. All that wrapped up in one big package. And then last week, why, brothers and sisters, that's that question why. I'm going to get to the lesson tonight, but why, brothers and sisters, it's not only an obligation, but it's an obligation. Right? God delivers us, right, not for ourselves only, but God delivers us as we begin to read this book of 2 Thessalonians, and we realize that it's a necessary obligation, right? Obligation to do what? To sing hymns, right? Uh, to give blessings, prayers, and sacrifices to God. Like you're doing here tonight. The reason you're here tonight, the reason you're watching by Facebook or listening by teleconference, it is a necessary obligation that we give sacrifices to God. I give my body as a what? Living sacrifice. Y'all got it now. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, our reasonable worship, being not conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Because God is the agent for their moral growth. That's what I said last week. And I hope y'all wrote that down, that God is the agent for our what? Moral. Our moral growth. We really can't grow morally without God. Without the Spirit of God living inside of us. And if you ever want to grow morally, and if you ever want to do the right thing in society, we must trust and have faith in God. And when we morally grow in God through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, Paul says, because your faith is growing more and more and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Listen, when we grow morally, listen, all Paul says there in verse number 3 of chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians, he says it is increasing. Why is it increasing? Why? It's a moral growth because of faith. Faith is growing more and more. And the more our faith grows, listen, the more our faith matriculates, the more we can love one another. The reason folk can't really love one another is because they have not grown morally. Right? But God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the Lord Jesus Christ, can help us grow morally. And the more we grow morally, Paul says in this church, we will have ever increasing faith to love one another. Moral growth leads to love. Love. Listen. Paul says, I heard about it. And I want to commend you on it. Because I believe in what the Bible says.
Bible says, brothers and sisters, that's why I like studying it. It's because how can we love God who we've never seen? And we have all these folk around us that we see every day that we can't get along with. But it says increasing, Paul says to this church, even though you're going through persecution, the Christian duty. What is the Christian duty? I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I go through, brothers and sisters. I know living in this world is hard to do sometimes. But in order to really have moral growth, Paul says we got to have faith in God. And then we can love one another. Mm -hmm. It says it is increasing. That means that it, it's increasing. Increasing simply means it's growing. And brothers and sisters, all of you got children and grandchildren, you look at them little babies, they, they didn't come out of adults. <laughs> Y'all ain't saying nothing here. They had to what? Grow. They had to increase. How did they increase? You had to feed them. You had to change them. You had to discipline them. You had to love them. You had to teach them. And the more you did that to your child or grandchild, or if you're a guardian of any child, the more they grew. Right? Now, in growing, right, I know when they get to a certain age, they think they want to do what they want to do. Mom and daddy call it smelling on your arms or acting madness. But because they have grown morally in what mom and dad taught them, there's always a line they probably would never cross. Okay, so let me lead into the lesson tonight. So, lastly, uh, Paul comments on their growing faith and love among other congregations. So in other words, he was boasting to other, other churches. Paul set up many churches. He was telling other churches how much this particular congregation was growing in love. And he probably said, why can't y'all do the same thing? <laughs> now, if you want a second Thessalonians, he was, you persevered and with faith. Listen, how many of y'all can understand that? Listen, how many of y'all perseverers? You persevered by faith during your trial. <laughs> During your trials. Let me say that again. During. You persevere during your trial. Not after the trial is over. Amen. People say, well, Pastor, I'm just going to wait till the, till the fire stop and then I'm going to praise God. Okay. <laughs> now, how many of you can raise your hand, those who are at home or listening or here? Raise your hand and say, I've learned as I'm moving morally growing in Christ that I can praise God during the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Because I know a God who can cool the storm, who can calm the storm and cool the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So Paul was bragging to the other churches. This is why I like reading the second Thessalonians. He was bragging. Have y'all ever bragged to other people? I'm not, I'm not talking about conceited bragging. I'm talking about just boasting of what the Lord can do to other people. You know, we used to say that a long time ago, what he done for others, he could do the same thing for you. Yes, and that's what Paul was doing. And when Paul was doing that, brothers and sisters, listen, he was encouraging them. Amen. And what, what great, uh, 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 great encouragement that must have been that I'm going through, but yet I'm still encouraged. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, I don't need folks to encourage me. It's because we walk with the Lord, doing our trials, loving one another, I can encourage myself. Amen. Amen. And then, lastly, this exposition on the destiny of the persecutors and the Christians in chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. The judgments of God are not just because God would change, excuse me, the judgments of God are just because God would change the forces of both the persecutor and the persecuted. Let me stop right there. See, you beat me a long time. You scandalized me for a long time. You persecuted me for a long time. You called me everything but a child of God for a long time. You hung my name on the signboards of evil for a long time. You did that to me, but one of these days, God is going to turn it around. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. He's going to change the fortunes of the persecutor and the persecuted. Can I get a witness here? Amen. But I believe, as 2 Thessalonians suggests, that persecution is not a sign of God's rejection, 
but rather a sign of God's acceptance because of perseverance during the trial. Okay. All right. So let's get to tonight's lesson. Let us bow heads and pray. Father, we thank you again for leading us to this wonderful book of 2 Thessalonians. Yes, and Father, I pray that whatever is said tonight will be pleasing in thy sight. Mm -hmm. Lord, I ask you to help me make it plain in Jesus' name. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians. That was chapter number one I just gave you. Let's look at chapter number two. Everybody turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number two. Dear brothers and sisters, as you lead out of chapter number one, those 12 verses, and you go into chapter number two, I think it's um, 17 verses. Yeah. 17 verses in chapter number two. The thread to any writing, there, there is a topic and there's a thread that goes from that topic through any writing. Anybody ever wrote a letter and you start off with a thesis or you start off with a topic? Well, that topic or that sermon or that lesson, well, that lesson or that topic must be a thread minister throughout the you don't fear for that, right? You don't go out in the middle of the lake or the ocean somewhere and then try to get back because you might not get back. Just stay with the topic. Amen. So the topic of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through uh, this, this should be 17. Verses 1 through 17. Verses 1 through 17. Sorry. Should be verses 1 through 17. The whole thread through this lesson is going to deal with events before the Lord's second coming. Give y'all time to write that down. And that's all we'll deal with tonight. What are the events before Jesus comes back again? And so the thread is the events before the Lord's second coming is there's going to be a deception. And it's going to talk about the lawless one. The deception, because there were a lot of people being deceived. And they were deceived by the great lie. Right? The deception and the lawless one. Who's the lawless one? We're going to deal with Satan. Y'all know about Satan. His devices. So, events before the Lord's second coming, the deception or the big lie, and the lawless one, or the man of lawlessness. Okay? So let's deal with that. Y'all stay with me. In 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, what does that deal with? What does that mean? Let's look at it. It says here, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to, add to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth, or it's by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So we want to highlight that. We want to talk about that. So when you read chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, it's dealing with, what is it dealing with, Pastor Gallman? Well, it's dealing with the deception. The deception was false teaching. False teaching. So, somebody may ask, well, what was the false teaching? What was the false teaching, Brother 
brothers and sisters, where the false teaching was that the day of the Lord has already arrived or has drawn near. So here it is again. Just let me make it plain. The events before the Lord's second coming, the deception and the lawless one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 through, uh, 2 through 3, is a false teaching. The false teaching dealt with the day of the Lord's second coming. Okay? The day of the Lord's second coming. Or, the day of the Lord has drawn near. Paul and his companions gave exhortation not to become easily unsettled. You know, how did that work? Easily <laughs> unsettled. Isn't it amazing that you can say something to someone, all that stuff they believe for 30 years, you say one thing, they get unsettled about. Are along by the teaching allegedly from us. In other words, somebody was telling a lie. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen to you? They said they never put their name in it. This is what they said. <laughs> Y'all pray with me here. Uh, he says allegedly by us. So they can't stand on their own name and make any proclamation. They got to stand on somebody that's credible. And who was more credible than the author of 2 Thessalonians and his companions? He says, so you can't get unsettled, easily unsettled, or easily along by the teaching allegedly from us, whether it comes to you by prophecy, or by word of mouth, or by letter. Those three things. See, what and it doesn't really say, uh, it doesn't really say who generated the lie. It doesn't really specifically say that. But you know, how, you know how a lie is? It can penetrate. Right? It's like a virus in a computer. We don't know where it derived from, but Paul said that many of y'all out there, y'all getting along, if many of y'all getting unsettled, he said that came allegedly from us, somebody lying on us, right? whether it's by prophecy, whether it's by letter, and that way it said, or whether it's by word of mouth. Asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So somebody... We're doing a lot of false teaching that, hey, Jesus is right around the corner. You know how it is, uh, brothers and sisters, when we were children, or you to have children, and I know me and my sister, my mom and daddy used to go to church and leave us at home. We would cut the mic while they were gone. And we always had a lookout person. Y'all know. <laughs> You ever had a lookout person among your siblings? Look it out. And then we see my dad's that black Pontiac coming around the curb. But we start cleaning up the place. My sisters can tell you. Because we know that the day or the hour that Mama and Miss Cora was right around the corner, literally, they were pulling out that corner. But listen, we should have went to revival meeting anyway. But we falsified some things and said we had to do homework. <laughs> I know my sister's going to kill me. <laughs> Listen, we had, we all been children. We all have children. I don't know why children don't think mom and dad don't know that. Right? So here Paul says, <laughs> it says, there was some falsehood going around that Jesus is right around the corner. That Jesus is on his way back. Have mercy, my Lord. Or that Jesus has already come. Now, you know, that was a lie. Because if Jesus has already come, then there will be no more tears. There will be no more hurting. Amen. We will all be raptured. That word rapture means to seize or to snatch away. But he said it got to be a lie because we're still here. Listen, the cause and effect. Listen, anytime somebody, brothers and sisters, listen to me closely. Anybody, anytime somebody <laughs> does teaching, whether it's true teaching or false teaching, Anybody, anytime somebody does that, there is a cause and effect of it. What I am teaching you tonight and what I preach to you on Sunday morning, it should have a cause and effect. Either I'm telling the truth or I'm not telling the truth. It's going to have a cause and effect. And the cause and effect of the false teaching muddled, terrified, 
and caused anxiety among the Thessalonians thinking about Christ's coming and the believers gathering. That means the resurrection of the dead and living to him. In other words, during this false teaching, these people got terrified. But we're going to go down a little further. Paul said, don't you remember? Do y'all not remember nothing? What I taught you over in 1 Thessalonians? Y'all don't remember nothing. Isn't, isn't it amazing how us as Christians, I'm not talking about non-Christians, we, we're so easy to contract amnesia and forget what was said to us. Amen. These people had no reason to be terrified and have anxiety about Christ coming because it was already said that there's something that must happen. There was an event that must happen before Christ come. But People are always gravitating or engaging with candy. Mm -hmm. I said it last week. Why? Because candy tastes good. Can I get a witness in here? And and we and my secretary not here tonight. Praise the Lord. She's watching probably. But candy tastes good, right? I, and I must admit to my secretary, know she's watching. I ate two pieces of candy today because I engaged with it, right? <laughs> but if you eat false teaching and candy long enough, it rottens out one's teeth, right? And it kills you because candy has no substance for life. It has no carbohydrates. It has no minerals, no protein, right, to keep us alive. It does nothing from us but give us a sugar high for about an hour, and then when the sugar is gone, we collapse. Amen? These particular Christians in Thessalonica, they gravitated toward candy. False teachings. That's it right there. False teachings. Isn't it amazing that false teaching sounds better than the truth? You know what, Dick? I'd rather, not me, rather, but maybe I used to, gravitate by something that sounds good, teaches, keep it to themselves, how they're itching in, right? How many times in our scripture, in our Bible, that God people gravitate toward the false teaching? It's all in the Bible. They, they rather believe the lie than the truth. You know why? Brother Sister said, because the truth, not only will it set you free, but sometimes the truth is hard. Okay. People rather for you to tell somebody a lie than to tell them the truth. Because if you tell them the truth, oh, well, they're not going to like me no more. They're not going to call me no more. They don't want to be my friends no more. So what do you do? Keep lying to them? you got to tell folk the truth. Amen? Amen. Trish asked me, hey, you like them shoes? <laughs> she gonna kill me. They can face up. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and see, when y'all hear me preaching all of a sudden, that's cause I wasn't telling the truth. Yeah. And I want y'all to come and lay hands on me. No, I'm but Trisha always tells me the truth. I can't, I don't like that next time. I think I'm looking good. No, I'll take that thing off. <laughs> so, uh, so it caused anxiety and it caused them you know, to be terrified. Thinking about Christ's coming, the believers gather, gather. When it says gathering, that means when the resurrection happens. The resurrection of those who are dead and the resurrection of those who are alive. The, the, the rapture, the siege in the way. The dead in Christ shall rise what first? And we who are alive shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the middle of the air. They got confused on that. They thought it was getting ready to happen now. That's why I said last week people start quitting their jobs. Right? Because they thought it was getting ready to happen. So let's move on. So let's look at chapter 2 in that, in that A clause. So we're going to stay with chapter 2, verse 2. We're going to look at the A clause. Okay? Let's look at the A clause. It says, so the encouraging message to them and is relevant to us tonight, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Right? 
the deception and the lie. So Paul told them, don't let or allow people to deceive you. That's what he says, people to deceive you. Don't allow, don't allow people to deceive you, especially with false teaching. Stay with God. Sure, the road may get rough. Sure, the hills may be hard to climb. But you've got to stay there. Yeah. Stay firm. How many times do you read in the New Testament it says, stay firm. Mm -hmm. Walk worthy to the vocation to which we are called. You've got to stand there. Stand firm means to establish thyself. Mm -hmm. And so Paul says in that A clause of uh, uh, verse number three, don't let anyone deceive you in any Listen to this, in any way. Brothers and sisters, in any way. I don't care if they come through the back door, the front door, through the chimney, through the window. In any way, don't let folk deceive you. You stay with God. Don't even, don't even think about even engaging with it, giving it any thought. Listen, we come too far to turn around now. Listen, been too, too much hell in life. Been through COVID. Been through uh, uh, saying so long to my loved ones who died. Been through sickness, through pain. Establish myself in God for someone to come along and to say something that we know ain't true, but it sounds kind of good because it gives us that sugar rush and we walk with that. Right? We trust in that. The prosperity message without the suffering message is false. Because when you're not prosperous like the preacher said you should be, or the teacher said you should be, then you stop trusting in the power of God because you didn't get what you thought you wanted. And then in that B clause of uh, verse number three, it says, let me make it plain. It says, the day of the Lord will not come until the rebellion Desertion from God. Rebellion means people turning their back on God. The day of the Lord will not come until rebellion. That's the B cause. Rebellion. Rebellion. What does that mean? Assertion of God. How can a man how can a woman turn their back on God? But according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3, B clause, the day of the Lord will not come until this happens. And so when you turn your back on God, that's rebellion toward God. And the man of lawlessness there it is. The man, see, it's a deception that leads to something else. Because then you start listening to lawlessness, which is foolishness. Right? And it says, until, the, until rebellion occurs, that's number one. And then it says, and the man of lawlessness. So number one, it must be the day of the Lord will come when there's a rebellion with people, uh, Turn away from God. And then number two, number two, the lawless one, or the man of lawlessness. So these are the two things that 2 Thessalonians was talking about. So that's the thread. The thread is the events before the Lord's second coming. Is this the deception? This the lawless one. And so he warns them, don't let allow people to deceive you. Number two, because the rebellion must happen first, then the lawless one must show his ugly head. Uh, it's revealed. What is lawless? What is lawless? See, Pastor, you got to know what is lawless. Lawless means the antichrist. When you say anti, that means something is against, or someone is against the truth. Jesus says one thing, and an antichrist says something different. That's lawlessness. 
What is lawlessness? Lawlessness is the lack of following the law. That's simple. <laughs> if, you, if you fly down the road and it says 65, you're going 100, you're not, that's lawlessness. You're just a person that don't care. When it says no soliciting, you go soliciting, you're breaking the law. When you steal, you're breaking the law. You are a person of lawlessness. I get that. So what is the lack of the lack of following the law? When you when it's lawless, it's simple. It's spirituality, it's sin and iniquity. Right? That's what happened to Lucifer. That's what happened to Satan. They, they said he was a good cherubim until iniquity, iniquity was found in his heart. That means he was lawless. He fought against God. Well, he, you know you can't win. How are you going to fight against God and win? I don't care how much lawlessness you have. You can be lawless to, to Jesus come back, right? And we're talking about that anyway. No pun intended. But you're not going to beat God. You're not going to do it. So that's what lawlessness is. It says, until the man of lawlessness is uncovered, revealed. So, the deception and the lawlessness. So, let's move on. Let's look at verse number four. Let's look at verse number four. This lawless fit will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. He will oppose and will exalt himself. Not God exalting him. He will do what? Lift himself. So, the author is giving a description of the actions of the lawless one. So you keep a watchful eye. You keep an acute eye on what's going on. Because what he's going to do is he's going to say of somebody that's better than God. Or he may slip and say, I am God. Y'all ain't saying that. Because it almost seems like that's impossible to watch as well as and it says, uh, he will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship. Then it says, so he sets himself up, so exalt and set himself up, it's synonymous to one another, in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. You know what that is? That's unbridled pride in the last day. Brothers and sisters, those who have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 15. Verse 14 or 15. Verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. Chapter 5, verse 14. We'll turn to 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 8. Oh, it's mixed up with right so much. Okay, that's what I mean. There it is. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 
It reads, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But I like number nine, too. It says, resist him, standing firm in the faith. Not standing firm in a faith, but in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is going undergoing the same kind of, there's that word again, prosperity. Oh, no, man, suffering. Does it say prosperity or suffering? Suffering. Right? Affliction, suffering, affliction. Amen. This lawless figure, as he exalts himself or sets himself up, self-proclaimed divinity without being divine. Self-proclaimed divinity. And during this era of antiquity, of ancient history, all of the emperors, see at first Rome used to be a republic and then it became a one-man show. Then they formulated emperors. It used to be just senators and then it became one-man show. So you had uh, emperors, and I have three of them down here, uh, uh, there were many more, but I have three, Caligula. You had Augustus, you had Julius Caesar. They were emperors. Matter of fact, Caligula decided that he was going to set up uh, pagan statues in the temple of God. He was on his way to set that up, and then he got assassinated. That's what happened to him. <laughs> but in this context, in what Paul or the author is trying to convey to us, let's talk about God's temple. What does that look like? Because you got to really read it. God's temple. What temple is that? What, what is God's temple? Is it Jerusalem or is it the church? Y'all just tell me folks. Is it Jerusalem or is it the church? This phrase does not mean the actual temple. Y'all listen to me because I'm going to explain that. The lawlessness one shall set himself up, right, or exalt himself. And then it says here, in God's temple, proclaim himself to be God. So we got to ask him the question, what is God's temple? Or what is he trying to say in the context of his right? Again, y'all stay with me. This phrase does not mean Zion here, David. It does not mean the actual temple or the center of their religion. That's not what it means. Or in this case, he was right to the church. It actually doesn't mean an actual church. But let me tell you what it means. And it took a lot of study because I had to get it in my mind. And it makes a lot of sense to me. It means the imperial cult that flourished in Thessalonica during this period. And you translate God's temple in transliteration, or in translation, excuse me. It is the temple of the Lord Jesus, God. The temple of God or the one who calls himself God. It denotes the church. So in other words, he would set himself up. So he would set himself up in the society. Yes, who would be here? <laughs> Among church folk. <laughs> who are the temple? Yeah, I y'all got it. Okay. Yep. Who are the temple of God? Y'all stay with me here. God's temple. God's temple. Not the actual building, but this temple. And so what this lawless figure would do, uh, it denotes the church as a society, and the idea is that the lawless one will present himself. Uh, present himself in the midst of the church community to claim honors and reverence due only to God. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. So, that makes a lot of sense. Because, listen, brothers and sisters, he's just not going to 
set himself up in a building because only a few folk in there. He's just not going to set himself up in a temple because only a few folk in there. So what the lawless one does is, and his scheme and devices is he will present himself in his own way or he will set himself up in the midst of the society <laughs> to give you the lie. <laughs> Stay with me. Because there ain't no good for him just to have coming about cabbages. I said, no, that he can face is that the lawless one back there? <laughs> I don't know what Brother Jonathan might do. They might jump on the lawless one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but the lawless one is going to listen. Listen closely now, y'all watching me. Is going to present himself. This is the church community. This is the church community. The lawless one says, I'm going to go in here among the saints of God and I'm going to declare honors from them that's only due to God. Right? So that way I'm going to take this little lie and spread it all around. I'm going to exalt myself and I'm going to spread it all around. I'm going to lift myself To do what? To deceive. God's oh, God's temple. You y'all get it? He says he's gonna sit up there. No, let me sit up one time. Not an actual brick and mortar. And what is it? It's called, um, we call it a psychosomatics. The more you perpetrate a lie. Tell me about it. This one. Who I love studying the Word of God? I tell you. I hope y'all getting this. Am I teaching you something tonight? This something? Listen. Listen. And I got to move on. I got on a few more minutes. But not only does he get in there. Brothers and sisters. But he's, when he exalts himself, he's going to try to take away what belongs to God. You know the sad thing about it? Some folk give it to him. <laughs> Some folk have been deceived by the lifting, by the exhortation. Some people have been deceived in this great church community of believers like you and me. And the Bible ain't stopped there now. Let's, let's move on. Because God has to do something about it. God has to do something about it. And what God does about it is not what you expect. Let's look at Let's look at verse 5 through 12. And then I'm going to let you go. I'm going to read those seven verses. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. That's back over at uh, 1 Thessalonians. Right? Chapter 2, verse 9. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Right? So something is holding him back from really lifting themselves. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. <laughs> Y'all feel me? It's already at work. Listen. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. 
And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and, mm -hmm. and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wicked, uh, wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful what? Delusion. So that they will believe the lie. Good God, God. God. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So anyway, anyways, brothers and sisters, what they're saying is this. There's a call to remember what they have been taught. Y'all read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. See, I said it earlier. It is a call. In order to stand firm with God, there is a call to remember the track record of God and what God has already done. What holds the lawless one back? What is holding him back? I know they say something about supernatural, but it could have been the government at the time, the government of law and order. That could be it. It could be the effects of the gospel message, or it could be just the Holy Spirit itself, himself. But something, it doesn't really say. It's holy. It says you know, but it, it doesn't say who it is or what it was. But it's holding him back until all of this is perpetrating itself. Because it hasn't been revealed yet. We don't know where he is. He can live in your community. He can live in your backyard. He can live in the politics. He can live in religion. We don't know. All we know is there's a call to remember that didn't Pastor Gallman tell us that years ago? Paul said, didn't I tell you that? It's a call to remember. And if you remember, it'll stop you from following the lie. Or stop us from following the lie. And then it says here, the lawless one being revealed and taken out of the way is the final process of judgment. So after, it is, after he is revealed, it's the final process of God's Judgment. Christ's splendor means doom for the lawlessness. Because what does light have to do with God? You know, Deacon Face, you and I talked about it one time, a long time ago. It could be a room that's completely dark. But if you write like one little match, it dispels the dark. I talk about one little match, not a big bonfire, but one little match can dispel what a whole room. And so it says here, Christ's splendor means doom for the lawless one. His splendor, his glory. Supernatural activities come from Satan and a credit to the lawless ones in the eyes of men. Right? There will be signs and wonders that God allows. God allows it. He said, what do you mean, Pastor? God allows it. That means God has power over Satan. If you allow your children to go outside, you got the power to bring them back inside. Even if you have to use a stick. Now watch yourself, Pastor. Watch out. You got the power. Brothers and sisters, listen. It says here, uh, supernatural activity come from Satan and a credit to the lost ones in the eyes of men. So turn with me real quick to Mark. Chapter 13, verse 22. Everybody that's listening and watching, turn to Mark chapter 13, verse number 22. Mark 13, verse 22. It says, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and do what? And perform signs and wonders to do what? To deceive. If possible. What does that mean? If possible. <laughs> even us. That's why the Bible says, be careful you stand, least you fall. 
Because the schemes of the evil looks mighty good. Y'all ain't saying that to me. Listen, I know what I'm talking about. I've been doing this for a long time. The schemes of the enemy can perpetrate the minds of even God's elect if you don't stand firm. Jesus was out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He was the elect son of man who came to redeem humanity from their sin. Yet, Satan made it look good for him. If you are the son of God, turn those stones into bread. If you are the son of God, jump down from the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the son of God, I'll show you all the kingdoms of the world that I will give to you. You just fall down. They look good. The candy looked good, didn't it? But Jesus says, I can't forget that it is written. <laughs> Y'all stay with me here. That you should serve, love the Lord your God with all your heart and what else? It is written. And only him shall you serve. The church community, God's temple, said that the advice is to make it look good. And he, they'll be warned here about the thread that I talked about earlier. The deception and the lawless one. They're both synonymous to one another. The end goal is to deceive. The end goal for Satan is to deceive, which is the counterpart of the gospel message. The gospel message is to deliver. Satan's devices is to deceive. God's message of salvation is to relieve. Satan's message is to deceive. And the way we are saved, let's see, uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we got to make a choice. Brothers and sisters, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't come to keep you long tonight, but we got to make a choice. Our lives and lives of others depends on this. In verse number 11, uh, let's go back to verse number 11 of 2 Thessalonians. Verse number 11. It says here, some, and other, in essence, it talks about it. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so they, that they will believe the lie. Who said it? God. God's, but let me tell you what that means. Saul did not respond in obedience to the gospel, which is the truth. Refusing the gospel opens a person to deception. Deception is a choice. God says, I've given it the gospel, I've given you Jesus. And through him, now we have the right in belief to eternal life. I'm giving that to you. There was some who refused the message and when you refuse the message, it's easy to be tricked. And the Bible said he ain't kept even the very elect. Deception, brothers and sisters, is a choice. You don't have to choose to be deceived, just walk with the Lord. And whenever Satan comes up against you, you got to remember in walking with God, no weapon, no deception formed against us will prosper in us. God in his judgment sometimes gives people over to sin. He gives people over to sin and it's not like God didn't give it to you, but God says sometimes we get tired of it. I'm giving it to you. Right? I waited on you. Right? Judas, come here, Judas. You walked with Jesus for three and a half long years. You see them heal the sick, raise the dead, preach the gospel, set the captives free, and you chose to deny him. I mean, uh, excuse me, betray him. You gave yourself over to it by believing it in what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said. Sometimes people, uh, sometimes give people over to the sin and error 
God that they embrace reprobate minds. And that, that what the Bible talks about. It is not that God withheld it from us. You chose not to listen to God. And if you chose not to listen to God, deception is a choice. So you know what? Like uh, the temptations used to say, standing on shaky ground. And the reason you're standing on shaky ground because you have no spiritual covering. The covering is gone. Come, listen, brothers and sisters, listen, I'm telling you the truth. Saul, Saul was the king. He was the people's king, but he was the king. David even recognized that. He says he shouldn't touch God's anointing, no matter what he did. He was the king. But because he chose to do something that Sam, not Samuel, uh, that the, uh, the priest was supposed to do, Samuel came and told him, because you have been deceived in this lie that you can do what you're not supposed to do, God has taken something from you that's very important, and that's his kingdom. Romans chapter 1. Y'all hurry up with me. Hurry up. I got to get out of here. Romans chapter 1, verses 24. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Then I'm going to end it. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Okay. Y'all got it? Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Type that in there for me, Brother Turner, so we can move on. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural uh, sexual relations for unnatural ones. Who did that? God allowed it to happen because it was their desire and they refused to listen to the gospel message. That's what 2 Thessalonians is talking about. Okay. So, to end it, in chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, it talks about one important thing. Believers should stand firm. Believers should stand firm. I've been saying this the whole time I've been up here teaching. That believers, you got to stand firm. In verses 13 through 14, this is the second Thanksgiving in contrast sharply between those who reject the truth and perish. It is a sharp contrast. A sharp contrast between those who reject the truth and perish. The first fruit, it talks about the first fruit. The first fruit represent Old Testament divine selection or consecration of their harvest and firstborn. The first fruit is saved. The first fruit, we are the first fruit. The first fruit is saved through sanctification, through sanctifying, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and believe in the truth. That means, brothers and sisters, let me get to the heart of the matter. If you believe in the gospel message, God is setting us apart. That's what he's saying. It's a con sharp contrast between those who are deceived and those who are deceived. It's not that they didn't know according to Romans chapter 1. They knew. But they refused to listen. We who are being sanctified, sanctification simply means like the first fruit, like the harvest, grain, and the firstborn animal, uh, animals of the Old Testament. Sanctification means that God is sanctifying us. It's that moral growth I talked about. God is still working on us. Y'all ain't saying that again. Listen, brothers and sisters, we have a lot of dross and impurities on us, right? God is burning off those things that so easily beset us so we can walk worthy and justify before our God. We, minister, are his first fruit. Y'all ain't said that. That's how much God loves us. We're his first fruit. This is what it's... And because we are his first fruit, deacons, we ought to stand firm. We ought to establish ourselves in his word, in the gospel message. Uh, verse 15 is an appeal to be steadfast to stand firm and hold fast to the teaching they received through the preaching they heard and the letter they received found in 1 Thessalonians. I've already given it to you. What's wrong with y'all? What's wrong? I'm already giving you the gospel message. You got to stand firm. It ain't changed. Listen, deacons, it ain't changed. What has changed about for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? That ain't changed. It ain't changed that a soul that sinner shall 
shall die. He ain't changed that. You got to stand firm in what you've been taught. Quit running right here. That's what people jump from church to church, going from ministry to ministry, trying to find a utopia, mm -hmm. trying to find that ethos. They're all over the place. They become spiritual church hopping nomads. How they say that? Trying to find, and God has said, establish yourself somewhere and get what God is trying to give you. <laughs> and quit jumping around and hopping around. Most people are joining churches because of personalities mm -hmm. and not because of filled, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm telling you. So in, in verses 16 and 17, he repeats the first prayer. And you look at it, he repeats that first prayer that he gave at the beginning. He repeats that prayer of encouragement. God has given us the incredible ability to accomplish his great mission. He has given to us through spiritual gifts. Telling our, and telling our society how to find salvation. It may seem strange that the Lord works through fallible people like us. How can God work through a vessel like me? Look at all the stuff I've done. Look at all the places I've been. Look at all the things I've got in my mind. And God still uses me. What's the song? If you can use it, body Lord, you can use me. You can use me because I've gone through the fire. I've been through the flood. I've been broken into pieces and lightning flashing from above. But through it all, God, you can use me. I'm not all that I know I should be, but God, with you by my side, I can be what you want me to be. Y'all ain't said that. I'm about to preach up here. Listen, but you can use me. As fallible as I am, do I make mistakes? Yes. Will I continue to make mistakes? Yes. But God says, hey, look, I can take a dirty vessel like you and sanctify you and set you apart for me. Yes, sir. Good God. <laughs> but like in the days of Paul, we have to trust that God will strengthen us to do his will. How many of y'all believe God can strengthen you? Yes. Sometimes yes. when we get weak, then am I strong? In my weakness, that don't make sense to me. That sounds like an oxymoron statement. That in my weakness, yet I'm still strong. The devil can't do nothing with us. He can't even listen. Even though he's perpetrating this lie and trying to exalt himself, we ought to call it what it is. You are a lie, devil. And you've been a lie from the beginning. Yes, yes, yes. And even that devil don't know what to do with a person like you. Listen, God knows Christians will face pressure from persecutions, false teachers, worldliness, and indifference to waver from the truth and lead the faith. So God calls us to pray for and encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ to hold on to the truth that they have been taught. And in due time, God will see them through. Yes, Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Thank you, God. So, I got one more teaching to do next week. That's from chapter number three. So y'all read chapter three. Amen. Y'all read it, and then y'all study it. Read it, then study it. Don't just read it and say, well, I don't read it. Read it and study it. Second Thessalonians chapter three. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be filled with your Holy Spirit to receive the truth. Father, so many people have been deceived by the lie but God, you have kept us in truth. Yes, For we believe in what Jesus has taught us when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. And no one can come to the Father except through him. Mm -hmm. So Father, we want to tell you that we love you and we thank you for loving us even the more. Yes, and Father, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters. We encourage all those who need encouraging. We engage with them through prayer through our hearts and minds to let them know that God can make a way out of no way. And no matter what their struggles and what their trials may be, God, you can do it. If they will only believe that you can do it, God. So we ask that you would touch someone who's feeling feeble, touch someone who's hurting, touch one, someone who's having battles with sickness and, and situations in their physical and spiritual bodies, God. We, we just thank you, Father. Father, all those who are members here at Mount Calvary, God, that are still uh, standing in the need of a blessing, standing in the, need of, in the need of prayer, God, we ask that you will touch them, God, and bless them and keep them, God. Father, our covenant partners who reach out, who listen to us Wednesday after Wednesday, Friday after Friday, Sunday after Sunday, God, touch them and bless them too. Thank you, God, for being a Father who loves us and cares. And 
thank you for allowing us to have the right to call you our Father. Yes. And Father, we just give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Yes. Now bless us as we go out from one another's presence. And be with us, God, always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you and keep you. And we look forward to seeing you this coming Friday for our call to care. And then on Sunday morning uh, for our worship service. Uh, we're going to be having a revival here in April. April the 11th and 12th. We'll have two great speakers to come. Two great preachers to come. So we'll keep you informed on that. Y'all have a nice Wednesday. We look forward to seeing and talking to you soon. Amen.